Well, hey there, lovely. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Amy from Unmistakably You, and we are here today to talk about creating a seamless guest experience at your wedding. It's something that I think people generally put a little bit of thought into, and that's awesome because obviously your guests are those special people who are there to support with you, uh, to support you and to celebrate with you. And they're the most important people in your life. So it's really quite, um, quite important that you do put some time into thinking about how to make their experience as positive and as seamless as possible. So today we're going to go through three things that I think everybody needs to consider when you're thinking about how to set up your wedding day so that your guests have that really positive, very seamless, enjoyable experience where they're going to go home saying, wow, that was a really awesome wedding and I was really comfortable and I felt really good about everything instead of saying, oh, you know, it was a little bit chaotic and I was confused and I didn't know what was going on. So we want to make sure that we avoid those things so that your guests have a really uh, fun experience and they can really enjoy and celebrate with you in a positive way. So those three things that I'd like to talk about today are communication, comfort, and appreciation. So to jump right in, in terms of communication, I really think that this starts right away. So make sure that right from the first communication you have with your guests, whether that's a save the date or an invitation, or if you are putting out something online in terms of a website or an evite or something like that, you do want to be really clear about the structure of your wedding and your expectations for your guests. And so what I mean by that is that you'll want to communicate really clearly about attire, so what kind of attire are you hoping for? Is it a formal wedding? Is it a semi-formal? Is it casual? And that'll depend a lot on the kind of day that you've set up. So whether that's an outdoor sort of barbecue style, very informal, and if you're okay with people wearing, you know, like button-ups with no ties and khakis, then communicate that casual attire is okay. Um, the worst is when you don't have any communication about that and you wear your, you know, four-inch stilettos and you're sinking into the grass all day. So make sure that you communicate what you're comfortable with in terms of attire to your guests so that they know what they should wear. You'll also want to make sure that you really clearly communicate timing with regard to food and uh, sort of activities. So if it is a ceremony in the afternoon with a cocktail, dinner, and dance to follow, you can put a line right on your invitation that says, you know, cocktails, dinner, and dance to follow, or something more creatively worded, of course, or cute. Uh, you can also and should also put that information on your website if you have one, so that guests know what to expect, especially if you are not feeding them a full meal. If you're doing a cocktail style reception, then the first thing I would always advise is that you schedule it away from a standard meal time so that guests don't expect that they're getting lunch or dinner. Make sure that if you're doing like an evening event, maybe you started at seven so that guests have time to have dinner on their own first and then make absolutely sure that you communicate that in your invitation and on your website if you have one because guests if they're if they're starving all night they will not be happy campers so make sure that you communicate to your guests whether it's a cocktail reception you can put a line on your invitation that says cocktail reception to follow and schedule it away from a standard meal time you'll also want to be really clear about the bar especially if it is a cash bar or a toonie bar or anything like that. I don't do a whole lot of those, but we do some, and it's really important that you get, let your guests know because if you are, for instance, on private property or you're at a facility that doesn't have an ATM machine, you're going to really want to make sure that your guests have cash with them if they are expected to pay any amount for drinks. So let them know whether you spread that by word of mouth or whether you put Toonie Bar on your invitation. Make sure that guests do know if they need to bring money. Um, you also want to communicate about kids, whether or not kids are welcome. And there are lots of ways to do that. You can Google itinerary or sorry, invitation wording and you'll come up with a million different iterations of all of these things and ways to say them on your invitations. But let guests know whether children are welcome or whether it's a an adults only event, because if if they 
have to guess and bring their kids and they're the only ones with kids, then it's gonna be awkward for everyone. And so you need to set the tone of your day, keep it consistent, so don't allow some kids and not others, but make sure that you communicate that to your guests well in advance of the wedding as well. Now, during the wedding, you're going to want to make sure that you continue that communication so that guests know where to go and what to do throughout the day. So I would first suggest that after your ceremony, you it's very common to have your officiant make an announcement that lets guests know what they need to do next. So if they're proceeding from a ceremony area to a separate cocktail area, and then they'll be invited to be seated for dinner at a later time, have your officiant announce that. I do a lot of outdoor weddings where sometimes guests actually need to move their chairs from ceremony to reception location. Have your officiant announce that. So anything that guests might have a question about, it's totally acceptable to have your officiant make that announcement at the end of the ceremony. If you're moving from a ceremony venue to a separate reception venue, and if there's a time gap, it's especially important that they announce that. If you have a ceremony program, you could of course print that in there also, but a lot of guests miss things. And so if you've told them, you know, 12 weeks ago in their invitation, ceremony is at you know, this church at two o'clock, reception begins at this hall at five o'clock, there's going to be a gap in there and they're not going to remember that. They're going to think, okay, church, hall. They're gonna leave the church and go to the hall. Your hall's not gonna be open, they're not gonna be ready to serve, your guests are gonna have this awkward time where they can't get a drink and they're just sitting around waiting for something to happen. So make sure, especially if you've got that big gap, that you have your officiant announce at the end of the ceremony and or put it in your program, that the cocktail begin at the hall at 5 p.m. And then guests will know, okay, I've gotta go home, I've gotta go check into my hotel, I've gotta go find a Tim Hortons to hang out at. So just make sure that there's no question about what time the reception begins. I would also advise you to have some signage posted at your entrance if there's any confusion as to where guests are going. So a lot of times if you're having a reception at a hotel, they will print up signage at the front door so that your guests know where to go. If it's not going to be immediately obvious, you might wanna have a welcome sign with some directions as to where guests are to go. You may want to consider printing up an itinerary sign or a chalkboard depending on the style of your wedding. I would advise you not to get too specific with it because if things do run late or run early, you don't want to mislead your guests on the day of, but giving them some kind of an indication, whether that's in a ceremony program or on a sign, um, giving them some kind of indication as to how long the cocktail hour will be and how long the dinner or when the dinner seating will happen, um, that's, that's going to eliminate some confusion for them. I would also really advise you to have someone to direct guests on the day. Now the hope is always that that's your coordinator, day of coordinator, full wedding planner, or venue coordinator. If you don't have any of those people, then I would suggest that you perhaps enlist the help of your MCs maybe to help communicate with guests. So if you're moving from a cocktail reception into dinner seating, you don't want guests to be seated too early and then they're sitting at the tables with nothing to do. You also don't want them to straggle in over the course of an hour when you need to get them seated so that you can start dinner. So whether that's a venue coordinator or a day of coordinator, you're going to want to have someone who is going to cue your guests as to when to be seated. And I always want to do that if the wedding party is doing photos in between during that cocktail hour, I always want to give the cue to be seated to the guests once I know those photos are finished. If your photos happen to be running late and someone seats your guests and then photos drag on for another half hour, then you've got your guests sitting around for half an hour, 45 minutes with nothing to do and that's awkward. So make sure that you give some direction, um, indicate rough timings to your guests through signage or programs, and then have a human being who gives them the cue to actually sit. And Melly says she's using a rustic palette to make an itinerary on to let them know what times are, um, what times are what to, to the end of the day. So definitely a really great option. I've done, I've seen lots of palette signs and, and chalkboard signs and that kind of thing at, at rustic weddings. You could print up a poster and put it on an easel and you know do some nice greenery or florals on it if you're having um, you know a more classic or elegant style of wedding. Signage is definitely something that's really important to help your guests know what to expect. 
Okay, so in terms of communication, that happens pre-wedding, really important, and during your wedding. You're also going to want to give some thought to guest comfort. And this is something that you need to pre-plan, and this is going to you know, involve a little bit of guesswork because you don't always know what the weather's going to be like on your day. If you're getting married in the middle of August, you can pretty well assume that it's going to be hot, but it might be rainy, so you need to plan for that as well. Um, you can pretty much assume if you're having an October wedding, it's going to be a little bit cooler. It might be beautiful and you could do a ceremony outside or it might be rainy and freezing and you would have to have a, an inside plan as well. So do put some pre-thought into how, how the weather and the elements are going to affect your guests. If it's likely to be cold, you may want to plan for um, you know, a guest favor that would help out with that if it is cool. Maybe you want to purchase pashminas in your wedding color or have blankets available if you're planning on doing an outdoor ceremony even if it is cold. You might want to, if you're having a tent wedding, think about having some tent heaters either there or on call and you can make that decision a couple of days before. Most tent companies will reserve a heater for you. Of course, you would have to pay a deposit to reserve that, but you don't necessarily have to have it there if the weather looks like it's going to be really great. Keep in mind that, especially if you're having a tent wedding, temperatures will drop at night. So even if it's likely to be nice and warm during the day, if you're having a reception that carries on into the evening and late into the night, you will want to accommodate for the fact that it is going to get cold. So you can, there are a couple of different styles of tent heaters. If you're having a tent wedding, you can get a, like a furnace style that's really a big square block that sits in one corner of the tent and has vents that then distribute through the tent or you can do a patio style heater which are those vertical um, ones with the shades that you see on on patios at bars so think about that if it's likely to be cool think about having a hot drink station this can be something that can you you can theme towards your wedding um so you're doing you know a hot cider bar you can use florals and decor that really bring it into your theme. Uh, hot apple cider bars are one of my favorite because there are so many fun um, liqueurs that you can mix into your hot apple cider or hot chocolate or tea and coffee. I actually went to my cousin's wedding a couple of years ago and it was in, in the bush in February. And so they greeted guests with a really beautiful antique dresser that was set up with hot apple cider that was really very welcome at that time. Uh, and Melly says bonfire, definitely something else that you can think about if it, it might be cool in the evening if your venue permits. Of course, all of this depends on where you're having your wedding. If you're on private property, you can pretty much, you have carte blanche to do whatever you'd like. But if you're at a venue like a barn, for instance, or somewhere like the clearing, I'm thinking locally here, you want to make sure that you confirm that that's able to be done with the venue owners. Now, if it's likely or potentially rainy, you would probably want to have some umbrellas on hand, not only for your wedding party and you for photos, but also for your guests. Think about if it's a, an outdoor wedding or if you have a long trek from the parking to the entrance of the venue. Think about maybe having some greeters who have umbrellas who are walking back and forth with guests to their cars, just in case guests didn't bring an umbrella of their own. If you are at a venue where your washroom facilities are not inside the venue, so a barn or a tent, you would want to potentially have a, a bucket of umbrellas at the door so that guests can grab one, go out to the washroom and come back and not get wet if it does happen to be raining. Um, so think about the potential for rain. You can of course make that decision earlier in the week if the weather forecast is looking bad, but it's something to definitely have on your radar. If it's likely to be really hot, reverse the options of what we talked about if it's likely to be cold. Um, so creating a cold drink station is really nice, especially if you're doing an outside um, ceremony, to set up maybe some ice water and some lemonade or some iced tea or something like that so that guests can grab a drink as they come in and have something to cool them down if they're likely to be outside for half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour during your ceremony. Um, just keep in mind with any of these drink stations, and again, this depends on your venue and the services that they provide, but do keep in mind that you will want to provide some kind of garbage receptacle or recycle receptacle. If you have bottles of water, what are guests going to do with those bottles? 
a recycle bin is not the prettiest thing on the planet, but it is nice if you have no venue staff to clean up after your ceremony. It is nice to give guests somewhere to dispose of their plastic cup or their water bottle if they have them. I actually did a wedding. Oh, it was when my daughter was, was just an infant, so it would have been three years ago. It was on private property for the ceremony, and then the guests all went to a secondary location for the reception. So I sent my team ahead to the reception, and I stayed behind to clean up because there were piccolos of champagne, there were beer cans, and there were water bottles all over the lawn where they had held their ceremony. So I thought I'd kill two birds with one stone here. I was going to do some cleaning up, and I... I was breastfeeding at the time, so I thought, okay, I have to pump, I'm gonna pump. So I strapped my pump to me and I'm cleaning up and I have a garbage bag and not very glamorous. So anybody who thinks wedding planning is super glamorous, here's, here's a wake up call for you. Nobody told me that the caterers for the brunch the next morning were showing up to set up. So all of a sudden I hear hello and I turn around and I've got my pump strapped to me and the caterers are standing right there. And I was like, well, this is awkward, <laughs> but you do what you have to do when you're a working mom. So do think about how your guests will dispose of their containers because otherwise you will have a big mess on your hands to clean up. Um, also, if it's likely to be hot on your wedding day, uh, think about providing shade for your ceremony if it's outdoors. If you have the luxury of big trees, set up your ceremony under the trees. If you don't, you might want to think about providing paper parasols for guests to hold over their heads and, and provide a little bit of shade. Um, so think about how that's going to look. Um, you might also want to think about providing fans. Uh, often we do program fans. So this is something that is really cute, it's useful, and it's actually effective in creating a bit of a breeze if it's likely to be pretty hot. So you can style those um, in a number of different ways. I do them all the time just using those thick popsicle sticks as, um, as handles. And then you can take an eight and a half by 11 printed program fold it in half with the popsicle stick in the middle and voila you have a handy fan that you can also put you know fun games or information about your wedding party you can definitely lay out the structure of your ceremony you can introduce um, you know important people you can put on song lyrics or poetry or anything that's really special to you um, Another quick little story. I actually did that at my own wedding and we had a crossword puzzle on the back and we had uh, tied with little ribbons golf pencils so that guests could do that before the ceremony. And uh, one of my one of my clues was Amy's morning addiction and it was a three letter word with an E in the middle. And it was T. It was supposed to be T. T-E-A. But I'm sure you can guess what some some guests wrote. Anyway, be careful with your crossword answers if you're doing that. Uh, but fans are a nice thing that you can provide that are functional and cute as well. Um, and likewise, if you're having a, a reception in a tent, you'll want to think about potentially cooling your tent. So tent companies also rent tent air conditioners. They're not perfect. They're not going to keep your tent super cool if it, you know, you've got your flaps open and guests are coming and going and it's a super hot day, but it does help, that's for sure. So think about ways to sort of temper that heat and keep your guests comfortable. And then during the dance and the rest of the reception, there are also fun ways that you can think about your guests' comfort and keeping them, um, you know, relaxed and comfortable to enjoy the day. Um, often we see baskets of flip-flops so guests can change out their high-heeled shoes and put on some flip-flops for the dance. Of course there are bathroom baskets as well that are popular. Janice was asking about that uh, in the group this week and that's something that I see done a lot. It's certainly not an expectation. I don't think any guest would be upset if they came to your wedding and there was no basket of toiletries in your bathroom. It's definitely something that is a nice touch depending on your guests. I have seen this work really well where guests are really respectful and they only use what they need. I've also seen those bathroom baskets completely decimated you know, 10 minutes into the reception because somebody comes in and goes, ooh, free toiletries and dumps the entire basket into their purse. So depending on your guests and how you feel about that, um, as well as a little bit uh, in terms of the venue. If you're having an outdoor, a tent, a barn wedding and it's bug season, you definitely will want to provide some bug spray as a nice little gesture for your guests because that's not something that people commonly carry around in their purse. However, you know, Advil, Tylenol, um, breath mints, 
bobby pins, those kinds of things are more likely for people, for women to have in their purses or for guys to maybe have in their in their glove box. Um, so it's, it's a nice gesture, but it's certainly not anything that would be expected. And it's going to depend a little bit on your venue and on your guests as to whether you do it or not. Um, Brianna says she's debating providing fans. The atrium at the lamplighter does get really warm. It's a, uh, it's a combination of the humidity from the pool. And then it's basically a greenhouse because it has that, that, um, windowed ceiling. And so it can get quite warm in there, even though you're inside in what's technically a climate controlled facility. It's, it's not a bad idea. It can get very warm in there, Brianna, that's for sure. Um, Something else that I wouldn't have thought of necessarily until I chatted with a couple of mine who got married in a micro ceremony last week um, was to provide mints for anyone wearing a mask. So if you are having a micro ceremony, if you're doing a ceremony uh, this year, obviously we're still in the middle of COVID with all of the restrictions and a lot of your guests might be wearing masks. Wearing a mask with bad breath is not a pleasant experience. So I never would have thought of that, but uh, Nicole was, was lovely enough to point that out and she provided that for her guests because she's just one of those thoughtful people that thinks things through. So do give some thought to what your day is going to look and feel like and how the experience can be smoothed out or made better or more comfortable for your guests. So I have couples who in the past have provided those, they're called soulmates, those little um, plastic clips that go on your heel. So if you have an outdoor ceremony and you have guests who come with high heels, then you might want to provide some of those soulmates so that they don't sink into the grass. Little touches like that actually go a really long way to showing that you appreciate your guests and that you're thinking about their comfort. So that moves me into my third point, which is appreciation. Your guests are there to celebrate with you. They love you. They want to see you. And it's important to them that they get even just a little tiny piece of you on your wedding day. So at your wedding, I always advise my couples to try to connect, even if it's just for a second, with all of their guests. Now, the traditional way to do that, of course, is a receiving line, which historically would have been done as you exited the church, if you were having a church ceremony. Receiving lines get a really bad rap because they take up time and they can be awkward. But it does really tick that box of, hey, you know what? I had a meaningful interaction, even though it was really quick, with every single one of my guests. Now, obviously, during COVID, this is, it's going to be you know, we're re-envisioning everything. So a traditional receiving line with hugs and handshakes is likely not going to be an option. But you could certainly modify it and do a contactless receiving line where you are at least having a, a verbal interaction with each of your guests, even though it's quick. They will at least then feel like they connected with you on the day. Ways to make it less awkward are to include less people. So traditionally, you would have had both sets of parents, all of your wedding party and the two of you. And that's a lot of people for guests to make awkward conversation with if they've never met most of them. It's also really awkward for your wedding party because they have to say, hi, oh, thank you, oh yes, oh, lovely to meet you to 100 people or however many people are at your ceremony. So reduce the numbers to just the two of you and maybe your parents, but that will at least give you a way to make sure that you do connect with each guest. If you don't have the time or the desire to do a receiving line, we have lots of couples who go table to table during the reception. There are pros and cons to everything, of course. So if you're going to go table to table, know that it's going to make your dinner experience less smooth and more rushed. So if you have to get up and go see everybody at every table, it's going to take time. You will, of course, be served your meal first, so you'll be finished first, and you do have a little bit of time, but you would be amazed at how long it does take to go, you know, if you have a, a, a wed wedding, sorry, of 100, 150, 200 guests, that's a lot of tables, and if you assume that it's going to take you five minutes per table, and you've got 15 tables, that's, it's a long time, and it's going to exceed your dinner time, and I often see couples who have to rush through the last few tables, or where dinner drags on and on and on because they're going table to table and we can't start the speeches until they're done that. So it is a great way to make sure that you can see everyone. I've also had guests who do that table to table and hand out favors at the same time. So it's a great way to make that connection, but just be very mindful of the time that it does take. 
To be completely honest, my favorite way to make sure that you get some interaction with your guests is to have you as a couple join the cocktail hour. Now that means that you have to be creative with your itinerary for the day. So I love, and any of my couples know, that I love first look photography because it gives you a chance to be together as a couple with just you and the photographer and you can have a really honest interaction and reaction to each other, to seeing each other for the first time. Whereas if you see each other at the end of the aisle for the first time, you've got a hundred pairs of eyes looking at you and you might be a little bit less inclined to be honest with your reaction. You might stifle your feelings in that case. So I do love first look photography because it lets you be you and have just the two of you there for the first, first glimpse of each other on the day. But I also love doing your photography before the ceremony because it allows you to reduce, in many cases, the length of your cocktail hour. So if you have to do all of your photography in between ceremony and reception, it's going to take you two hours, most likely. Talk to your photographer, but usually about two hours. That's a long cocktail hour, which also is the hardest hit time at the bar. So keep that in mind. If you have a long cocktail hour, your guests are going to drink a lot more before dinner. Whereas if you can shorten up that cocktail hour, it makes it less awkward for your guests. It keeps your bar bill down. And if you've done your photography pre-ceremony, maybe you have to do just a couple of pictures with grandma or whatever after the ceremony, but then you can join the cocktail reception. You've got a drink in your hand. You can mingle around and talk to all of your guests. And it's a, a more casual way to have that quality interaction and to have your guests feel like they actually had a meaningful chat with you. Now again, always, you, everybody wants a piece of you. You need to be mindful of the time. If you have scheduled one hour for cocktails and you've eaten up 20 minutes of that with extended family photos, 40 minutes to move through all of your guests is not a lot of time. So I wouldn't advise trying to join your cocktail hour for any less than half an hour, depending, I mean, if you've got 10 people at your ceremony, by all means do it. But if you've got 50 or 100 or 200 people, it will take you time to get through them and it will feel like a quick rushed interaction as well. So make sure that you don't, um, you know, make sure that you don't make people uncomfortable by saying, hi, nice to see you, bye but you also have to be mindful of not getting sucked into a 20 minute conversation with one group of friends and then you can't visit the rest of your guests who also want to see you. So trying to have those meaningful interactions is definitely one thing on your wedding day. Um, in your speech is another time that I would really advise you to show your appreciation to your guests. Some of them will have traveled from a long way so it's nice to recognize that. Some of them will have you know, overcome obstacles to get there and they've they've been there to celebrate with you and to to enjoy your day with you. So it's nice for you to rec or to recognize them in your speech by either, you know, naming people who've traveled from a long way um, or who've who've overcome something. You don't want to make anyone uncomfortable, but it's nice to point out that you do appreciate that they've come from overseas or across the country. It's nice to just appreciate your friends who've come from next door. Just in your speech, make sure that you do indicate to every people you are that they've taken the time to be there to celebrate with you on this special day. And then of course, following the wedding, you want to make sure that you follow up with a thank you card. It's some would say it's an antiquated tradition, but I would argue that it's a really important thing to do. Um, one, to keep the postal service going. <laughs> and two, um, just to take a minute out of your busy day to show them that you appreciate their, their um, presence at your wedding and also their gift, if they've given you a gift. Um, you want to make sure that you do indicate to them that you appreciate that and showing them with a handwritten note um, that you that you do value their presence at your wedding is really a small token of your appreciation that's going to go a long way. So I think uh, in terms of communication, comfort and appreciation, there are lots and lots of ways that you can make your guests feel really appreciated and really comfortable and really sort of improve their experience. If you spend a little bit of time thinking about those three areas, prior to the wedding and then executing them on the wedding day, I think your guests will have a really um, enjoyable experience that they will talk about favorably for years to come. Uh, Melly says, plan is cocktail hour for everyone else to mingle as pictures are done with family and first look done beforehand. I love that. I That's that's my favorite way to do things because I feel like it's a more personal interaction with your guests than that kind of 
stiff and uncomfortable receiving line. So love that, Nellie. In any case, thank you all for being here. I hope you're enjoying your weekend. And as always, I am here to answer questions if you have them. Um, so send me a private message or plug in your questions here. Um, I'm always around. <laughs> We're not doing any weddings right now, which is highly unfortunate. We have a couple of small ones coming up this summer, but uh, I'm really missing the interaction with couples. So I'm happy to help in any way I can. Brianna says, a big worry of mine is keeping people entertained during cocktail hour before the reception. Um, now that we've postponed, I'm hoping to think of something. And that's, it's something that realistically people, people worry about, but ultimately your guests are pretty self-sufficient. Uh, you know, they're going to find somebody that they know that they haven't seen in a couple of years. You're going to have a big reunion of your uncles and they're going to be talking about, you know, oh, remember that time when. So unless you have a really, really long cocktail hour, if, if you're, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours, then you do want to think about providing guests with something to do. And that's why um, Melly has said here, little games would be helpful. Um, so lawn games have been really popular depending on your venue. Um, lawn games in the courtyard, says Christine. Um, I've also done little trivia games. So, um, you know, they, they have trivia cards to fill out, or I've done Mad Libs, those old fashioned uh, Mad Libs that are, you, you do them up as they're customized to the wedding couple and guests can fill those out. You can even incorporate something like that into the kissing game when you go into dinner, um, have someone come up and read their, their Mad Libs card. I've also had guests do um, almost like an old fashioned dance card where it's a get to know you mingling kind of, of experience. If a lot of your guests don't know each other, you can set up a, a little sort of mingling game where you, they have a card and they have to find somebody who, you know, traveled from out of town and have a little conversation with them. Or they have to find somebody who, I don't know, loves Led Zeppelin. So finding ways to have your guests mingle is something that you can provide for guests during the cocktail hour. Melly says Polaroid guest book. That's also something that does bring people together. You can have lots of fun groupings of, of guests. Um, and they take a, a cute picture and it ends up in your guest book. I've also had um, guests seated early before dinner. Um, we did this a few years ago and it was so much fun. Not a lot of people do it, but, um, oh, and my husband says, who doesn't love Zeppelin? I don't know. There might be people who don't. I don't know. It was the first thing that came to mind. Anyway, at a wedding a couple of years ago, I had guests seated early before the dinner and they had to come up with a creative photo pose for their table. And it was a, a way of getting the ice broken at the table and a way of getting photos done of every table so that you were sure you had a photo of everyone, every guest at your wedding. So what they did was they had to put together a creative photo pose and then we put on the Benny Hill theme song and the bride and groom ran from table to table and they jumped into every photo grouping and it was super fun we did not get it done in one time through the Benny Hill theme song we had to play it a couple of times but it was really really fun it was it took a little bit of time off the end of the cocktail hour before dinner um, so if you're creative about it there are lots of ways that you can keep people entertained but you don't have to feel like it's your sole responsibility to pro provide them with something to do for every second of that cocktail hour people are pretty self-sufficient if you give them food and some drinks they will be happy to just mingle and chat. All right, so thank you again for joining me here today. If you are uh, inclined to pop into our Unmistakably You Facebook page on Tuesday night, I'm continuing our Meet the Team series. We'll be talking to Chrissy on Tuesday night. And of course, I will see you here next Sunday at one o'clock. If you have questions you'd like me to answer, I will. Uh, you can write them in and I'll answer them live. And uh, otherwise, we are going to, I'm actually not sure what we're talking about next Sunday. So if you have a suggestion or a question, that might be what we talk about next Sunday. So enjoy the week, stay cool, and I will catch up with you soon. Take care.